I've been playing Yu-Gi-Oh! competitively since 2008, and throughout all the years of bad ban list drama within the community, there's one incident even I didn't know existed until only recently. Did you know there was a riot over Yu-Gi-Oh! cards in the Tokyo Dome? No, not the most recent live stream that took place within the Tokyo Dome, but in the 1990s. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Avery, and similar to our Yu-Gi-Oh! retrospective series, this is a Yu-Gi-Oh! story time about the riot and Tier 0 format that followed, which saw Exodia become unstoppable. This is going to be a part 1 where we cover the riot, and if you want to hear about how Exodia became a Tier 0 deck after this giant riot and the fallout, then be sure to like the video, smash the ever-living boo-boo stain as we like to say, and leave a comment letting me know that you want to see it. Thank you for supporting this channel, and this is a History of Yu-Gi-Oh! Storytime Edition. Shout out to Mr. Bad Guy on Reddit for covering this story. This entire script is pretty much made from his retelling. Yu-Gi-Oh's first truly great drama. A drama so old that it existed before the anime, and so great that it was reported on before the game even came out in America. Yu-Gi-Oh! is known today as one of the most popular TCGs in the world, springing from the mind of manga writer Kazuki Takahashi, God rest his soul. It has been diving up and down for 22 years and shows no signs of ever stopping. It is known for its high-speed lunacy, devoted, but sometimes grumpy player base, look at the format right now, with Snake Eyes and soon-to-be Fiendsmith, and being a game that people stopped playing for over a decade, come back to, look at, and then squeal like a girl. But that's now. This was then. In the year 1999, Yu-Gi-Oh! is primarily a manga that runs in Shonen Jump, with a single short-running anime, a couple of video games, and a burgeoning card game based loosely on the video games, which were themselves loosely based on the game and the manga. That is currently six months old. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s early days were very strange and very rough. In the first few months, there was no tribute summon mechanic, which caused cards like Blue Eyes White Dragon to be ludicrously overpowered until the Master Guides canonized a new rule set. Many common rules, such as effect monsters and many types of spells and traps, back then called magic cards and trap cards, were in their infancy or simply didn't exist. Even some common types and attributes didn't exist in the first few sets. It was rather clear in those days that Konami saw the card game primarily as a side project to their video game efforts, which which is proving very successful. Many would say that even today, Konami sees the actual card game as a side project. Many cards and mechanics were derived from those games, and the first tournament ever was held the same month as the game's release, and featured a video game focused tournament being held in equal billing to the card game focused one. So with that in mind, it's not surprising that Konami would decide to hold another tournament, and this time, it would be bigger and better. On July 1st, letters arrived in the mail, an invitation to the Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters Legend Tournament to be held in the Tokyo Dome. It explained further that the tournament would go through a set of preliminary rounds, which would be played out by having duelists wager star chips, with each player starting with two, until they ended up with 10, with those to collect 10 within a time limit being able to progress further. Those of you who watched the show as kids can probably remember that these are pretty much the same rules as Duelist Kingdom, the first big tournament arc in the manga. Those of you who remember the show like I do can probably recall that Duelist Kingdom was full of players doing things like stealing star chips, gambling for higher stakes to get opponents to accept higher betting odds, entering the tournament without valid identification, or just physically beating the crap out of each other. Those with particularly good memories can probably recall Recall that Duelist Kingdom had only 80 people on its guest list, not the, no doubt, thousands that would be arriving for a tournament. Aside from the natural prestige of the whole thing, it was promised that a small print run of prize cards would be made. Only three copies of Firewing Pegasus would be made, goes to show how old this is, to be given to the top three. Copies of Meteor Black Dragon would be given to the top two, and the winner of the whole affair would receive what was at the time the only known copy of Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Oh, and just to sweeten the deal, Konami threw in a little fun fact. The tournament would feature a special pack of cards which would only be available at that event, the Premium Pack. Special packs available at tournaments still happen to this day, but they're generally treated as a sneak preview, with the pack getting a wide release later on. Think of something like a sneak peek with the upcoming Infinite Forbidden. Here, the pack would apparently be exclusive to the event. Things went south from there. 
Yu-Gi-Oh! was a young game, but it had already earned itself a reputation as a very pricey one, and one where a lot of duels would come down largely to who had spent the most on their deck. Many cards were strictly inferior to others, who would play Genin when Rogue Doll exists. Many spells and traps had dramatic, excessively powerful effects, such as Raigeki and Monster Reborn. There was also only one quote-unquote starter box set, meaning that a lot of these cards would have to be gotten the old-fashioned way. What was more, Konami had also gotten a taste for packing in strong cards with promos for things like guidebooks, video games, and other such overcosted side projects. For one of their more brazen feats, behold the situation of Duel Monsters 2 Dark Duel Stories, not to be confused with the Dark Duel Stories released in America. This Game Boy Color game came with three cards randomly chosen out of a selection of ten. These included type and attribute specific equip cards that utterly outclassed the booster pack based equips. The first truly generic equip, which was also a trap, a card that essentially killed an opponent's deck for three turns, and a card that nuked the opponent's spells and traps at no cost. Keep in mind again, this was a full priced video game albeit a portable one. It came with rare and powerful cards, and you weren't even guaranteed which ones you would get. Maybe you'd get Sarayu, Cyber Shield, and Insect Armor with Laser Cannon, and you'd just have to deal with it. Oh, also, just to add insult to injury, they made two different guidebooks for the game, which also came with their own promo cards. Incidentally, the final stage of this video game takes place in the Tokyo Dome, an obvious advertisement for the event to come. The point is, at this stage, the game had developed a reputation reputation for sticking incredibly broken stuff behind a steep price, and this was starting to attract vultures. In fact, the most common term for the best decks of the era was simply good stuff, because they invariably consisted of the player's 40 best cards with no greater strategy in mind. This wasn't helped by the fact that at the time, only three cards were on the limited list. Remember, a quote-unquote forbidden and limited list wasn't invented until 2004, meaning almost everything could be played at three copies. So when Konami announced that there would be a set of cards that would only be sold in one place ever, you can imagine the response. On August 26, two months after the letters went out, the Tokyo Dome opened its doors. A week before the event, Konami had made an announcement. Rather than the event being restricted to players and the families of players who had received special invitations, anyone who could prove they bought Shonen Jump in the past week could attend the event, though they wouldn't be able to participate. Shonen Jump happens to be one of the most widely circulated publications in all of Japan, and anyone remotely familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh! would own that week's volume, so one can imagine how much of a barrier for entry this was. This was most likely done to ensure that more people could attend the event and buy the packs than just tournament players their families, and it went horribly right. The Tokyo Dome is one of the largest stadiums in Japan. It is the home stadium of Japan's oldest and most successful baseball team, the Yomiri Giants. It hosted Michael Jackson 21 times on various world tours and Madonna 7 times. It has a capacity of around 55,000. And on that day, arriving on all manner of public transport, roughly 65,000 kids Parents, collectors, and scalpers descended upon the Tokyo Dome. Things began to go wrong immediately. Aside from the 10,000 people who were locked out of the stadium entirely due to massive levels of overcrowding, estimates at the event suggested that around 10,000 people had no interest at all in watching or playing in games and showed up specifically to pick up the premium pack. They immediately swarmed the area to try to find it and discovered that one thing Konami absolutely had not prepared for was how much they wanted it. There was a total of one singular vendor and they didn't have nearly enough. Side note, could you imagine going to a YCS or a regional or maybe your country's nationals and there's one venue that venue? There's one vendor at the whole convention. That would be the equivalent plus add in 55,000 people. Sorry, 65,000 because remember they were overcrowded. Surprised at the chaos and commotion, representatives declared that they would be postponing the sale of the premium pack for two hours while they worked out how to give them out. And so people stood or sat jam-packed together in sweltering late August heat and waited for their cards to go on sale. At the end of all of this, the representative announced the worst possible thing anyone could have said in that situation. Sales of the premium pack would be canceled. This went over rather poorly. 
Within minutes, a full-scale protest began to break out, which escalated into a riot. Accounts from players at the event described them being packed together too tightly to even move, with them trying to escape the dome to get away from the ensuing fighting. Insults were shouted, demands were made, and control of the situation deteriorated by the minute. 80 riot police were dispatched to the event to try to break things up with accounts by their chief claiming that it was nothing like any crowd he'd seen before. People were protesting well into the night. In the ensuing riot, two people were hospitalized and dozens more suffered minor injuries, which were treated on site. The tournament was canceled before it had even left its preliminary rounds. The largest and grandest event in the game's history had turned into a catastrophe, and to this day, in the Japanese fandom, it stands as the most negative attention the game ever received on a large scale. In the aftermath, the premium pack, the set of 10 cards upon which this whole endeavor was spent, ended up being converted into a pricey mail-away order that would require proof of attendance to pick up. At this point, it caused a level of suffering for an unopened container not matched since the Ark of the Covenant. Those of you listening may be thinking, if you're not still shocked at the absurdity of a riot based on a card game, were the cards inside even worth it? At this point, much like the Ark of the Covenant, it would not be a surprise at all if they did indeed melt the faces off those present. Due to the nature of the premium pack, all players who bought one would receive all the cards inside. They consisted of the following. Slime Toad, aka Frog the Jam, Dharma Cannon, Turu Purin, and Dancing Elf were the sort of filler booster pack trash that leaves trees weeping for their creation. The most interesting about them is that Slime Toad's English name caused some mishaps because they initially called it Frog the Jam, and then an actual frog archetype came out years later. I'm probably going to butcher this name, but oh well. Mikazuku Yaiba, Meteor Dragon, and Cosmo Queen were tribute monsters. Mikazuku Yaiba was arguably the worst one you could own at that point in the game's history, and its English name should have just been kept as Crescent Dragon. Meteor Dragon was only useful for fusing to make Meteor Black Dragon, a card which had two existing copies worldwide, and Cosmo Queen was perfectly fine as a high-level beater, with only Blue Eyes beating it out, but Blue Eyes was being phased out at that stage. Time Wizard and Goddess of Whim were cards with gamble effects, each required the player to toss a coin. Time Wizard's coin toss resulted in either the opponent's field being destroyed or the player's field being destroyed and them taking damage in the process. Goddess of Whim's coin toss resulted in its attack being either doubled or halved for the turn, meaning it could be somewhat strong for the time period or completely worthless. Needless to say, neither was worth the risk. The final card in the set was Exodia the Forbidden One. I hope you guys enjoyed this part one. If you did, be sure to let me know down in the comments and let me know if you want to hear part two where we tell the story about the fallout of this whole Tokyo Dome riot situation and how Exodia went on to be a tier zero deck due to this whole premium pack situation and what cards were on the ban list at the time. But I really appreciate you all watching this video. Again, let me know if you want to see part two. I'm happy to make it. Guys, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.